Easy introduction to programming and reactive programming explained. I recently quoted a new programmer stating, coding is basically just ifs and loops. And that is true, but it is also functions, which is kind of the base reality of programming. And you can of course add stuff beyond that. Let me show you how that works. All programming languages are basically calculators at first, where you can say variable named result equals one plus one. The result variable will end up holding the value of two. And to display the contents of the result variable, like on a calculator, you have to say print result. A variable is just a way of storing things. A variable stores variable content. I'm sorry to say that the different languages have different ways of printing things and print two different things. If you wanted to print something to a debug console that you can open in a web browser with just shift, control and I, you would say console.log, open parentheses, result, close parentheses, enter. Or you can just say console.log, open parentheses, one plus one, close parentheses, followed by the enter again. This two will print number two. Now, if you wanted to print something to the web page that is currently open, instead of console.log, you would say document.body.textContent equals one plus one which would just show number two in the entire window. So there is no one way of printing things. It just all depends on context. Everything in programming is like that. It is all about what you are trying to do. If we wanted to create a calculator with a print function that does print to the web page, we would simply say function print open parentheses input close parentheses open curly bracket document dot body dot text content equals input close curly brackets. This means the print function will accept input and that input will be later assigned to the text content property of body. So it's really easy to create your own print function. And I think there should be a revolution in computer programming where every programming language has a simple and plain and useful print function just as an invitation to young programmers so that everyone can just say print hello world and get a taste for programming. So in the beginning we can add and subtract. But to do anything beyond that, we pretty much need functions. And I say, if you don't have one, the first thing you should always do is just to create a simple print function, even if just for debugging. And where it will be printing just depends on what you are doing. Functions abstract and automate, you see. And yes, we have more than just numbers and functions in a programming language. We also have groups. But I think I am the only person who uses the word group here, so be careful. No one calls it that. But for us, the normal people, arrays, strings and objects are kind of really just groups of things and it really helps to view them as such, at least at first. Arrays 
are a way to hold multiple things under one name. Strings are pretty much arrays of letters. Languages use a lot of good ideas to be useful, so it is best to think of strings as the next level of abstraction beyond arrays of numbers. So, we are moving up the abstraction ladder here, from just numbers to lists of numbers, and now just strings. By extension, we can now have lists of strings, so lists of English words, and then lists of numbers, like phone numbers, and lists of functions, like, well, different print statements that print to different places. And finally, there is one more grouping thing. It's the one that changed the world. It's called an object. Objects are not lists. Objects name things rather than to just keep them in a sequence. So you say some object dot some really useful name equals some value such as Alice or my calculator dot result equals one plus one. You can get stuff out of a list by number, it's called an index number. But it is better to use objects and then retrieve things by name. I don't want to make this too scary at first, but since an object can store a variable, and objects are variables, then you can have nested objects. You can say mother dot baby dot name equals Alice, where baby is just an object that has been stored in a mother. This is a really weird example. It's 2 a.m. and <laughs> I can't think of anything. <laughs> Here, we finally arrive at that coding is basically just ifs and for loops. So we basically just covered the stuff that this quote glosses over. Calculations, variables to remember them, functions to simplify stuff, arrays to hold sequential lists of variables of all types, strings that hold text, and objects to group things under some name. And by things, I mean everything we learned so far. Variables, functions, arrays, strings, other objects, arrays of objects and functions, and more and more and so on. You see how when we add something new, even something as tiny as a list or a string, we are enhancing our abilities because these things connect together. They enhance each other and the powers that we have. So it's just like buying new tools. At first, you start with a screwdriver and it takes a little while to get things all set up. But then you buy an electric drill and it has a screwdriver mode. So not only you can make the holes, but also hurry up when getting the screws in there. So we're just enhancing our abilities step by step. Okay, so when we say result equals one plus one, we execute a statement in time, in sequence. Before, we don't have a result. After, result exists and it holds the number two and the calculation is done. It will never rerun ever again. So we're just moving down a page, executing things one by one. This is where ifs come in. Now we can say, if result is greater than zero, print result. Else, print error, error, something has ran afoul. Did you remember to add your numbers? 
and you bet your fanny that you can nest if statements. Oh yeah, you can make computer programs really smart. So now we explode in multiple directions inside a program, depending on some variable, some parts of your program may never run. See, you are now controlling a machine. You are now writing spells like a wizard. No joke. Whatever you can imagine, you can now send down a path of logic and produce a result. Really cool stuff. There's one more thing here that we need to upgrade because arrays are kind of no good to us if we just refer to all the items inside them by numbers. Arrays are then just like objects with stupid numeric names that we can't ever remember. So we need those loops mentioned in a quote. A for loop is just one of many kinds of loops. It is the most verbose and flexible, but there are others that are easier to type out and, frankly, reason about. With loops, we can say, for every person object in the array of people, execute some ifs and functions for me. See, it's really cool. The program just starts flowing for you. This is the base layer of programming. You can make really solid programs here. The longer you stay in this level of abstraction, the more of a code poet you will become. This level of programming is somewhat similar to what we used to do in the 90s or 80s with those old 8-bit computers. Here you can invent state machines, create strange chatbots like Eliza, write multi-user dungeons that you can build inside out, and just thrive in the world of text as you print everything out to the browser window. There is much more to it, of course, but now things get harder to explain. You have to use strange new words. For example, objects are more than ways of grouping named variables. Though this is an important explanation of objects that you should never forget. Objects are groups of things. I once met a person who just could not switch from using functions to object-oriented programming. He looked at books and looked at tutorials and he was just like, you know what, I am a basic programmer, basic is a programming language, and I'm just going to stick with it because that's what I feel comfortable with. And I said, no, 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 no. You create groups of functions. So now you can have your program divided up into little pieces that are related to the stuff you're doing so that it's not all in one place. And he was like, yeah, I guess I'll give object-oriented programming another try. To be clear, when you put a variable inside an object, it's no longer referred to as just a variable. It's called a property. So objects have properties. And when you stick a function inside an object, it's no longer called a function. It's now referred to as a method. Oh yeah. And since objects can nest other objects, as in the terrible example above, they can model the entire world or entire processes. Objects are really, really good at mapping things out, at modeling the whole world. And you know what else? The one thing that people always forget about, when you say object 
add object, then inside that add method, you can tell that child object that the dot parent is this or the object that is receiving the child. So now all the child objects are going to have parents and you can go up the chain of parents to the root of your objects. It's really cool and it's really convenient. So you're creating these cross-connected data trees that are very useful for all kinds of mapping projects. Objects are also very precise. They indeed have two modes of existence as a description or a specification of something. So that's when you are sitting in front of your computer and modeling and adding properties and adding methods. It's like this literal definition of a thing. And then they have an instance mode where it has been instantiated with the new keyword and that has less to do with trying to map things out and now with putting whatever those things map out into play. And the reason why you want to instantiate objects is to have multiple instances of the same object. For example, you can have an instance of a calculator that is set up to write to the web page and an instance of a calculator that will write to your developer console. Now you can print stuff here and there in multiple places. A more saying example of multiple instances is a file object that groups file related operations or methods. You can now have multiple files represented by the same file object by simply instantiating the file object with a different path. So they will be a file object, but each will be representing a different file on your system. Files are a very primitive concept. You have to keep track of file handles and modes, like read, write, or append, and you have to remember to close them. They are a great candidate for being abstracted away with an object that has useful functions sitting right next to them. My favorite abstraction of a file is the now ancient action script file object. Every file you opened had a neat little desktop directory property. It seems like overkill and somewhat strange, but that would change based on what operating system you used. And it was right there in the file object. You didn't really need to ask anything else or remember some file system object that would have that property. No, it was all grouped together with files. Everything you needed was inside your file object. And I think that the finest example of object use is the component-based user interface. That just means you are creating a world of objects such as window, form, button, and then even draggable or selectable. And here you can say, my fancy program equals new window. Calculate equals new button. My fancy program add calculate. And finally, calculate on click equals function print one plus one. So you see how you have an add function where you can add a button to a window. That's an object-oriented abstraction. 
That's all you need to build massive user interfaces with menus, panes, tabs, slide out consoles and embedded browsers, everything all nested together in a reasonably readable way. Window add menu. For every menu item in an array of menu items, menu add menu item. I think web design greatly benefits from this type of clean abstraction, but I seem to be in the minority. I personally see the newer, refreshed dojo as being superior to React, and now the runes felt. Tidy object-based component architectures are just more friendly and more powerful and more flexible. Now that we have covered ifs and loops and tasted the strange vocabularies with words like instance, which strangely at my old job earned me the nickname buzzword boy, anywho, let us finally get to the really juicy part and blow some professional programmer minds or at least scare them and ruffle their feathers up a bit. There is something kind of neat and crazy that you can do with objects, and a lot of programmers either don't understand that yet, or more likely are kind of freaked out by it. One of the leading programmers has said that he made the JavaScript reactive, but that's only correct in the context of functions, kind of. In the broader context that includes JavaScript OOP programming, there has been this beautiful little thing that made the JavaScript reactive for a long time. And I will demonstrate it here with the X of a user interface component tree, where the X is part of the X and Y coordinate system. So it basically says this component will be placed at this X in the parent. But at the same time, I also want to give you a preview of this strange cool thing, so that you know this is not just some boring x to be used in geometric calculations. Beyond object instantiation, you also want to hoist yourself up to start using methods start and stop in your components. This helps to let your web components to, for example, stop listening to a mouse when you remove the component from the user interface. Every time you say on click do something, you need to add a mouse listener. And you better remove it when you get rid of that something from the screen. When for example moving to the next step in a form, you must remove the listeners from the previous user interface or you're going to be creating trouble. The start and stop methods are just the reality of cool cats working with the mouse. If you just leave your listeners laying around, then the mouse and other things will eventually conspire to get you, and memory collection will of course have trouble freeing up memory because the objects will still be up there. So that means... Your component, once instantiated in a stopped mode, or more usefully component.start at equals false mode, before you start a user interface component, won't be displaying anything in the browser, right? When it's not started, it's not doing anything. So if you try to make things in it draggable, Everything will crash because you didn't create anything that can be dragged yet. Yeah, that's the reality of working with a mouse. You gotta have a start and stop. The component, when not started, cannot be given draggability. And when you are designing your program, 
that's what you want to do is you want to create your component make it draggable and move on to the next component but this here is saying you can't because it hasn't been started yet and it's giving you memory problems so now you find yourself complicating things with a life cycle and storing things in arrays so that when you finally start the thing, they can be started. And that just makes the code a mess. There is a simpler way. By using a getter and a setter that divides the act of assigning to an object property and reading from an object property, we can create a cute little system that notifies things when the dot started property changes. So when an assignment is detected and we take that assignment and store it in our object, we will also do a second thing. We will issue a notification of change. Mm-hmm. So you say, observe started and do something, where and do something is a function that will be given the latest value of started. And this is the cool part. Anytime you say started equals true or started equals false and do something will be automatically executed with that value. Wow. So all you are saying is something something dot started equals true. And all the observers are given the value of started and can reason about doing their stuff. They can initialize things or shut them down. Thus, you bring your component to life. When moving to the next step in a form, inside your stop, you just say, start at equals false. And whatever is still listening to that will know it is no longer needed and must clean up after itself. You don't have to engineer large systems with life cycles anymore. It's just whatever you stick in your program needs to clean up after itself. And you can just focus on little bits of programming functionality. Now, let me show you how the X works. And then you can get that drink of water I know you want. To move a window, to move a window on your screen, all the way to the left, an act which can be really confusing, because where do you go, what do you do, what do you have to change and update and keep track of? In this system, you just say window.x equals zero. That's it. There is no refresh, no repaint, nothing else. You just assign a number to the X. And the window will react almost as if it was a living organism. As the X simply notifies all the different little observers that have interest in it. This greatly simplifies programming and makes it accessible to the novice programmer as well. By going an extra step beyond that start and stop and making the properties of an object observable and being mindful while creating your objects, while being in that first phase when you are creating the specification, being mindful that you're kind of creating an interface for the programmer, you're kind of creating poetry that others will be reading, that you really don't want to say things that are confusing, but you want to keep them simple, just dot x instead of dot horizontal position that the window is in, you make programming 
accessible to all. Reactive programming hides almost all the complexity. And when you consider that objects are programmer interfaces, a kind of a language that you speak to the programmer with, they actually make programming better. Reactive assignments make programming accessible to all. And the code becomes so readable to programmers that they won't ever want to go back to the non-reactive world. They will see that the non-reactive world won't let them request operations out of sequence. Not easily. They have to wait until a component produces elements so that the mouse can then listen to it and then they have to remember to run the stop. And here, in the reactive world, things just work in the correct sequence because functions are attached in the right places and without any strange syntax at all. It's just plain old assignment.